teaching this out of order here for your textbook, but it is the order of many textbooks to have it already at this point in the year. And what it is, is it's something called L'Hopital's Rule. It almost looks like hospital over there, you know, but it's L'Hopital, okay? He was a mathematician that he said, well, you know what? I found this pattern that works in some situations. And that's why it's not a, a major focal point in this course, because it's some situations. It's not all situations. But if we go back to chapter two, when we talked about limits, like here's a problem you had in chapter two. It was the limit as x approaches four of x squared minus 16 over x minus four. And the first thing that you do on limit problems is you take and you plug the number in. You would get 16 minus 16 and four minus four, which is zero over zero. <laughs> well, that's a problem, right? But that's what his whole theory is based on. If you have a problem that comes out as zero over zero, his rule works. It can't be of just the denominator zero and the numerator is one. It doesn't work then. It only works if both the numerator and denominator come out to zero, okay? Now, what I taught you then in chapter two that you could do here, because you didn't know L'Hopital's rule, you knew nothing about him, but you also didn't know derivatives. And because you didn't know derivatives, I couldn't teach L'Hopital's rule yet, all right? But what I taught you to do is I said, all right, if it comes out to these zeros in the denominator, then that means you should maybe be able to factor and reduce. That gave you a new problem, the limit as x approaches 4 of x plus 4. Then you plug the 4 in now, you get 4 plus 4, which is 8. So do you remember doing problems like that? You had to take it. I know that was a while ago. That was the first chapter that we talked about. So this it still works, all right? And you can always do that. However, I want to show you L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital, let me move this example out of the way. Oh, maybe I'm not going to move that example out of the way. I'll just do this instead. L'Hopital says, well, you know what? If you do get 0 over 0, then, if you just take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom separately, you also come up with something that you could use. So, going back to the original problem, if I take the derivative of the top, I get 2x. If I take the derivative of the bottom, I get 1. Now plug the 4 in. 2 times 4, 8. See how much less work that is? So, L'Hopital can be used, you can use it at this point, on any problem that the derivative of the top and the derivative of the, or sorry, when you plug the number in, if the top and bottom come out to zero. Okay. So what that does is it opens up all kinds of problems that I couldn't do by hand in chapter two. In chapter two, you had this is a non-calculator problem, and then this over here was a calculator problem. You had to take and figure out a different way to find the limit of that. So, let's apply it to all these more difficult ones that now we're going to be able to prove on here. This one here, you always have to check to make sure it's a candidate for L'Hopital's rule, okay? I plug the zero in, I get sine of zero over zero, which sine of zero is zero, so I get zero over zero. So it's a candidate, right? I have to check that first. That's my key to then using L'Hopital. If you don't show me on your paper zero over zero that it's a candidate, you don't have any business using his rule, okay? It's like that's your payment. You have to first do that step. Now from there, we say, okay, well, let's go ahead and take the derivative of the top and the bottom. Well, the derivative of the bottom is super easy. It's one, right? Derivative of the top, sine of 3x, that is a chain rule. Derivative of sine of 3x is cosine of 3x. But then don't forget the chain. You have to go in here and multiply by the derivative of the inside, 3. 
So now I have my new problem. Now I plug the zero in. I get three cosine of zero over one. Cosine of zero is one. Three times one over one is three. For this one here in chapter two, we would have had to have graphed this and looked from both the left and right side what value was it approaching, and it happened to be approaching a y value of three. It saves you the time of pulling your calculator out and everything. Now, it's imperative as to when this is presented to you that it's not presented at the time that you learn the quotient rule. Because this is not the quotient rule, is it? And so don't get it mixed up with the quotient rule. Lobital just takes individual derivatives of the top and bottom. He says it's not like this is a fraction and I'm using the quotient rule. He does not use the quotient rule at all on this. So make sure you don't get those two things mixed up. Okay? Next problem. Limit as t approaches 1 of t minus 1 over the square root. Now, I think that square root is supposed to go over the whole thing. No, nope, it's just over the t. The square root of t, just there, minus 1. <coughs> All right, so I first have to buy into it, right? I have to make my payment here. My payment is plugging that 1 in. 1 minus 1 is 0. And square root of 1 is 1 minus 1, which is also 0. Okay? So that means I can take the derivative of the top and bottom. Here's Lobital's rule coming up next. Derivative of t minus 1 is 1. Now, the derivative of square root of t minus 1, well, looking at the derivative of square root of t, so that's t to the 1 half, right? So 1 half t to the negative 1 half. Everybody agree? So I should probably clean that up. All right. When I clean that up right there, doesn't it mean if you have a negative exponent, it goes to the other side of the line, right? So my square root of t is coming up to the numerator. Now, what it, could I also multiply both the top and bottom by 2 to get rid of that fraction down there because we can't have a fraction inside of a fraction? And I don't really need that 1 in the denominator. Everything ended up going up to the numerator. Now I plug the 1 in. I get 2 times the square root of 1, which is 2. Yes. The negative on the bottom. This negative on the bottom? Okay. Okay. All right. Again, this is not 1. Well, actually, here's what we would have done on this problem in Chapter 2. We would have multiplied the top and bottom by the square root of t plus 1, the conjugate. So it's been a while. But we would have multiplied by the conjugate, and then from there we would have been able to plug it in. But multiplying that by a conjugate then becomes a big algebra issue. So it cuts out a lot of the areas where we might make mistakes on a problem. Okay. So I hope you appreciate Lobital's rule. You know, it's kind of like a gift almost because it saves you a lot of time. All right. All right. How about this one? The limit as t approaches 1 of t minus 1 over natural log of t minus sine of pi t. The only way I could have done this problem in chapter 2 would be to graph it and look around where uh, t or x is 1. Got to make my payment here. 1 minus 1 is 0 on the top. Natural log of 1 minus sine of pi. Didn't natural log of 1 come up yesterday or the day before? What's natural log of 1? 0. And what's sine of pi? 0. So I get 0 on the top and bottom. So I've made my payment. Now I can use Lobby Toll. It's like a toll, right? you got to make your payment before you can use the road, right? Same kind of idea. All right, so now let's... Take the derivative. Derivative of t minus 1, 1. Oh my goodness. What is the derivative of natural log of t? 1 over t, good. And then what is the derivative of sine of pi t? Of pi t. 
plus sign pi t. Is that what everybody said? Okay. The minus sign just got carried down, right? Like the derivative of sine is cosine. It doesn't, it's not negative cosine. So the minus that was already there just got carried down right there. All right. Now, again, right here, I could clean things up. Or since I'm just plugging a 1 in, isn't this just going to end up to being a 1? Right? So let's see. We have 1 over 1 minus pi cosine of pi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's cosine a pi. Cosine a pi. Negative one. So this is one minus pi times negative one. So that's one plus pi. One over one plus pi. That one there would have been very difficult on a calculator. I would have only been able to give a decimal that's close to it. This is an exact answer. This is even better. Okay. So L'Hopital can be used on limit problems. You guys ready for this? Switch. All right. So now I have some others here. These here, uh, I don't know if you guys have to do those. those. So they've asked, it, I've always taught L'Hopital's rule in previous years and such, um, but uh, as it turns out, you know, um, they've added it for this year. Like, it's never been on previous year's tests, and they've added it in. So, I mean, my kids always had it because, it's, again, it's a shortcut that you could use, and you were allowed to use it, but now they're going to give you problems that you have to use it on. But anyways, I'll still go over this. We did this earlier. We did this in Chapter 2, but so it's not a bad reminder. But what happens when x is approaching infinity or negative infinity? That really has nothing to do with L'Hopital's rule at all. Okay. This here has to do with the exponents. Because it's referring to end behavior. And again, you did this earlier this year. You also did it in Algebra 2 and Pre-Calc, okay? So it's going to maybe seem familiar to you. When it's not a number to plug in, it's either positive or negative infinity. It doesn't matter which one. You look for the highest power in each of these, okay? That's all you care about in these. 2x cubed over x cubed is 2. That is what the limit is as x approaches infinity. That happens to be what we call a horizontal asymptote. This graph has a horizontal asymptote at 2, so both ends go towards 2. Okay? That's if the exponents are the same. So if the exponents are the same, really it's just taking the coefficients of them, truly. And again, we talked about this earlier this year. When we get to this one, I specifically wrote it so that they're not the same. What happens when they're not the same? Okay. When they're not the same, you still kind of think of dividing them out just like you did those previous ones. This thing here behaves like the graph of 2 over x, which is a graph that looks like this. See how the ends are approaching a horizontal asymptote of 0? So I'm here to tell you that any time... The higher exponents in the denominator, it's automatically the y equals 0. It doesn't matter if it's like 2 over x squared, so the graph looks like this. Still, the ends go to 0. You know, 2 over x cubed, it's going to look more like this one again. 2 over x to the fourth, it just depends on where, you know, they're going. But both ends are still going to 0. They might be coming from the top, they might be coming from the bottom. So this problem here is if they have the same exponents, it is just their coefficients. This one here, higher exponent in the denominator, it's going to go to y equals 0. Uh, I think this is supposed to be a 4 right here. Let's change that to a 4 because we want the higher exponent on the top this time. Higher exponent on the top. 
means it's either going to positive or negative infinity. It's not going to a number. Some textbooks will say the limit does not exist because it's not going to a specific number. Okay, So you might see that does not exist as an answer choice as well, depending on how, what route they're going with the problem. How this one truly works out is if you take the higher exponent on the top, 2x to the fourth, the higher exponent on the bottom, you get x cubed, you end up getting 2x. Think of the graph of y equals 2x. Isn't that a line with positive slope? So if it says as x approaches infinity, they're talking about the right side, which means positive infinity. If it says as x approaches negative infinity, you'd be talking about the left side, which is negative infinity. That doesn't mean every problem is that way. Because it's possible if you had 2x to the fourth on top and x squared on the bottom, when you divide them, you get 2x squared. That's this. That means both ends are going to positive infinity. Okay? It could be what, that one of them's negative. And so all of a sudden you have like, oh, negative x cubed. Boop. That means this end is going up there, this end is going down there. So if you just still take the highest exponents and divide them, it then gives you an equation that it acts like. And so the ends of that bad boy act just like that little algebraic equation that you come out with. Okay, do you remember talking about that earlier in the school year, back in chapter two? All right, that is the conclusion of section 9.2. So now you can do the homework problems, which are just one through eight out of your textbook. Remember, you all have a textbook under your desk so that you can use.